that was. But, but it wasn't until recently that Darcy and I were looking through some things and saw two documentaries that talked about the problems that this church had, how the leader of, of, of this program's husband was murdered, and so on and so forth, and it was just a huge scandal. What do we take away from things like that? That not every spiritual-sounding idea is a good one. Maybe you can think of examples of where you have been deceived by what the world calls or religion calls or someone else calls as a word from God. We find Paul talking about this as well in, to the church in Colossia. I like what Colossians 2, 8 tells us. It says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophy and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Maybe think of some of the things that you've heard. Be they wrapped in some kind of spirituality or be they just secular wisdom that this thought here represents. In 2 Peter, Peter tells us that the message that they bring is a different message. There, verse, chapter 1, verse 16, Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths that were made known to you by the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Many times it that we find ourselves deceived by things because they tell us what we want to hear. If we're deceived by something, it isn't something that we reject, it's by something that we like to hear, we want to hear. Psychologists refer to such a thing as the illusion of truth effect. The illusion of truth effect. We see it in statements like this. Repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. Repeat a lie often enough, and it becomes the truth. You see, these are the things that the church in Ephesus is trying to combat. The first half of, of 1 Timothy 4 takes us back to the discussion that this book began with. And in this section, he's going to give us two warnings, things to watch out for, and two positive principles of how we can become strong in our faith. First, the two warnings. We see the first warning here in verses 1 through 2, and we see that Paul is making a contrast between what God's Spirit says and what these deceiving spirits say. I like the way the New Living Translation words it here, verses 1 and 2 in 1 Timothy 4. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and the teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. Now, the last times that we see Paul referring to here is not looking at when Christ returns, but it's this period of time between the first advent of Christ and his return. Paul is reasoning that during this time we are seeing people follow these deceiving spirits the teachings of demons, and this is a truth of what we find of how we are living in those last times. If we think about it, we see this still true in our world today, do we not? Today we find that those holding to a biblical faith is more the exception rather than the rule. You may have heard of a group that does surveys like Barna called Pew report, and it found that while 80% of Americans believe in a God, only about half believe in the God of the Bible. Now we might say, well, that's, that's okay, that's pretty good, but when we look to those, we, we find that even the majority of those who believe in the God of the Bible don't believe in what the Bible says. Instead, they believe things like, well, you know, always lead to God. Or, that's your truth, but my truth is something different. Truth is whatever you want it to be. But you see, these things are abiblical. They're false. And if we honestly examine them, we see how they fall short of the truths we see in Scripture. 
As I was looking at things, I came across a, a book done by a, a, a man that teaches in the religion department at Baylor University. It's a book called The America's Four Gods. And he suggests that Americans worship four distinct types of gods. The authoritative God, the one who is both engaged in the world and judgmental. The benevolent God who loves and helps us in spite of our failings. The critical God who catalogs our sins but does not punish them, at least not in this life, he says. And the distant God who stands apart from the world he created. As I look to those, I wonder, well, okay, those are the gods that people in this nation worship. And they're not formal gods, of course. They're more philosophical gods. But where is the god of truth and grace? He said, while sociologists try to understand the gods of a society, Paul wants us in the church in Ephesus to know the god of Scripture, the one who is revealed to us in Christ. And Paul is challenging us that anything other than that, anything other than that comes from the teachings of the demons. They're demonic in their origin. But how is that, we might say? Well, it's because it takes our eyes off of the truth. It takes our eyes off of God. It takes our eyes and puts them on ourselves. Paul's warning it's strong words if we look at them. He's saying that those who teach these dangerous ideas are what? They're hypocritical liars. How many of you have heard this before? The, the word hypocritical is a theatrical word that means to give a false impression. It describes me as an actor playing a role that isn't true. It's just me playing a role. And while that's good for me on the stage... It's not good for me to do from the pulpit. It's phony. It's hypocritical. You see, these false teachers have distorted the truth and were calling people to follow them. When someone turns away from God and goes a different way, that's certainly sad. But when leaders in the church do that, that's horrible. And that's what was going on in Ephesus. Notice what else Paul says there. He says that their consciences are dead. Their sense of right and wrong no longer exists. The first warning that we see here was that the spiritual person can't be influenced or followed by these deceptive teachings. In other words, if I was to add to this, I would say we need to be like the Bereans that Paul talks about in the book of Acts. The Bereans were well known because when they heard Paul saying something, they said, that's great, Paul, but let's go back to Scripture and see what it says. It should be obvious to us that not every idea about the spiritual life is a good one. However, time... It's not until later that we realize the danger. The second warning is found here in verses 3 through 5. But before we read it, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this idea of these demonic teachings that are being influenced upon the people of Ephesus. What comes to your mind? What kinds of teachings might these be? I don't know what come, came, comes to your mind, but I think of things, well, maybe it's human sacrifice, or maybe it's Encouraging them to participate in some horrid sin. However, when we look at this, we find that the warning is what I would call against extra-biblical teaching. Listen to verses 3 through 5. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods. But God created these foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know that it was made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. These false teachers were telling people, if you want to be strong in your faith, if you want to be spiritual, then don't get married and don't eat these certain foods. 
it may seem a little anticlimactic for me because these don't seem to be that big of things. I may not practice these things, but what's wrong with it? Well, there's much wrong with it when we start to consider it. Because if I look behind what it's saying, what they're doing is they're adding to what Scripture has said. That's why we call it extra biblical. It's something that's been added, teaching that's outside of the biblical text that we have given authority to. A thus saith the Lord type authority to it. We do it all the time in our world today. We, we hear these phrases that... that that we think may even be in the Bible. Like, God helps those who help themselves. That's in the Bible, right? Other ones are a little bit less, maybe things like moderation in all things, cleanliness is next to godliness. These things have some truth to it, but if you grew up hearing these things and thought it was what the Scripture says, we would have been led astray. False teachers were defining a spirituality that makes us the star of the show. And if you want to be spiritual, then abstain from marriage. Abstain from these foods, and you'll be pleasing to God. But that's not what Scripture says. In fact, when Jesus was questioned about what makes a man clean, what makes a man righteous, in Mark chapter 7, in verses 15 and then Mark's conclusion in verse 19. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You were defiled by what comes out of your heart. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. Paul's saying unto me, amen to this. These false teachers are saying, well, no. What is the basis then for these false teachers saying? As I said earlier, Part of it has to do with these Gnostic ideas that the physical world is evil. To grow spiritually, we need to separate ourselves from what is physical, like in marriage or in eating certain foods. To be good, to achieve a higher spiritual state, a person must regard these natural desires as being wrong. You see, Paul is writing to Timothy and the church leaders to correct the influence of these teachers in the church there. Paul's reason, he doesn't explicitly say it here, but his reasoning is that marriage and and the physical intimacy of a marriage and food, these were all created by God. And because they're created by God, they are good. Instead of viewing these things as being wrong, Because God created them, we should rejoice in them, seeing them as being gifts that God has created. You see, all in creation, we find, are good as long as they're enjoyed within the parameters that God has established. The second warning that we find here, it says that to consider what is behind what the false teachers are declaring. And if at the center there is this idea of how we can make ourselves righteous, we should check it. We should be careful. You see, our hope for salvation is seen in Christ alone, and anything more is likely to not be of God. The false teachers were associating spirituality with the denial of the things that God declared to be good. And therefore, it opposes what Christ has said. In the last half of this section here, in verses 6 through 10, we then transition to see two positive things that Paul wants Timothy to understand. Two positive ways in which we can grow in our spiritual life. The first is Timothy's ability to do all these things will depend upon his own nourishment and his faith. Listen to verses 6 in the first part of 7. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teachings you have followed. 
Don't waste time arguing over godless myths and old wives' tales. Timothy, remember the faith that has gotten you to this place. It wasn't your self-determination that got you here. It was your faith. The faith that you grew up in, the faith that you found in your mother and grandmother. Timothy hasn't abandoned these sound doctrines that has, that has gotten him to the place that he's at. But Paul is contrasting these sound doctrines that Timothy knows that he was raised in with godless myths and old wife's tale. Now, I think those phrases are familiar to us, but myths, we understand, are irrational and even bizarre ideas that people bring or say that, that can't be confirmed or verified. And the Greek philosophers use this phrase of old wives' tales to describe ideas that people believe. They believe to be true even though there wasn't a rational reason to believe them. We see this around us all the time. We won't take time to examine these. Go ahead, Parson, bring up the next one. These are two pictures, and if you can't see it, that's fine. The first picture we see there was, was when I was in Turkey, near Cap the Cappadocia region especially, I found these trees with these nazars tied on. And sometimes I'd seen cloths that were kind of prayers that were tied on. And there was this mystic kind of idea that wasn't truly part of, of Islam, but was a folk Islam, what people believe. The little things, if you hadn't seen it, I, I think I brought it home when I couldn't find it. It didn't take much time. But these little eyes, this evil eye that, that is supposed to protect you from, from the evil. Um, we have things like that, too. We have other things, too, like the book that I have here, that there's this cultural, even in the church, this desire to believe in these things that, well, like this book here, we find out aren't even true. This book here talks about the story of, you can't probably read the subtitle there, um, a remarkable account of miracles, angels, and life beyond this world, a bestseller. It was made into a movie, and yet it proved to be false when the mother said that none of it was true. But we want to believe. You see, these are extra-biblical kinds of things that, that we're drawn into. They tell us what our itching ears want to hear. We want to hear words of angels, words of people that came back from the dead. Paul in Galatians warns about these kinds of things. He warns of those who preach a word that is different than the one that was first preached to them. If he or even an angel comes, listen to Galatians 1, 6 through 8. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, preach to you let him be eternally condemned. The first positive principle to grow in our walks with God is to continue to be nourished in the faith that saves us. To be nourished in the truth that gave us new life. How do we do that? Now in part, yes, certainly the answer is seen in our private devotions, but it's good and it's right and it's even important for it to be done beyond that. As Eli began in our introduction, we're about building relationships. We need one another to speak into our lives. It may be through a Bible study that we attend. It may simply be having coffee with one of you to talk about the hope that we have in Christ. These are the ways that we are nourished spiritually. We need to hear from Timothy's example here and to be nourished in the truths that come from God. There's a second thing here, though, and along with this nourishment, we're told that we need to be trained. 
that there's training involved, that training in this godly living that we may encourage and train others as well. The last part of verse 7 through verse 10. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. It's interesting, as you look to words and their origins, we find that train is the Greek form of the verb that we get the word gymnasium from. It describes physical training, like the athlete goes through, to endure things in order to be able to compete. Training gives us some images when we hear of that. It's a word picture of the spiritual disciplines that we we will go through to strengthen our walk with God. Notice that Paul tells Timothy here to train himself in godliness. Godliness is simply a move away from this self-centered life to a God-centered life. Godliness emphasizes the, the relationship between what we believe and how we live. A God-centered life is a life that has accurate beliefs in God and is expressed in a consistent and appropriate way in our behavior. I was thinking of putting this up on a slide. Hopefully you'll see the image that I'm trying to paint here. But the culture changed us to live a selfliness life. Now, that's not a real word, but self life, a self-centered life, where we need to engage in training to shift us into a godliness life, a God-centered life. Physical training is a good metaphor for the spiritual training that we need. We understand how physical training requires effort in order to attain a goal. You see, I train for something that I desire to complete. Maybe if you've done any physical training, you find like I do, it's more difficult if I don't have a goal in mind, something I'm trying to achieve, to endure training. When I have a goal, then that training becomes easier. When I think about training for something like the the triathlons I've done, it's Certain parts are easier than others. In my older body, running is not one of the things that goes well in that physical training. But why do I do it? Well, because I have a goal. I want to complete something. And if we see the goal that we have, then we can endure whatever it is that is necessary in that training. If I need training in those areas to achieve physical goals, can I not see how it is also a good image of what I need in my walk with God? You see, while my goal as an athlete is to finish the race, my spiritual goal is to know God and walk with Him. Paul is telling us this image is good, but the goal is something even greater, to know Christ. Spiritual training is greater because what I attain is greater. Think about that. What do we attain? A God-centered life has eternal value for it prepares my life with God for all eternity. Now we may think about this and we may say, well, shouldn't it be just natural? Shouldn't it be just easy? But we understand how Discipline and training require something, and we set this goal. We understand that every relationship requires work. Just saying the marriage vows doesn't make the marriage, does it? It 
It's just the beginning. A relationship requires me to invest myself in it. And we shouldn't be surprised that in our spiritual life, to become more God-centered, our relationship will require effort. It will require training. It will require instruction in sound doctrine. Spiritual training involves uh, participating in spiritual exercise that are sometimes called disciplines. These spiritual disciplines can be likened, if you will, to exercises that the athlete will use to train. So when I'm training for something, I may have both cardio and weights that I'm training myself in to strengthen me. But as you think about it, it also requires me to withdraw from certain things, doesn't it? Training requires me at times to withdraw from things that are unhealthy for me, be it foods or behavior. And so spiritual training as a discipline will require both of these, for me to train in this one area and maybe to withdraw in another area. What do we have to withdraw from? Well, we use this idea of fasting as an example. Of fasting and praying, both of them typically require me to withdraw from something. Again, going back to what we saw earlier, I'm not withdrawing from things that are bad, but I'm withdrawing for a season to strengthen me within. I withdraw myself from other people to be alone so that I may pray, or as Jesus says, to go into my prayer closet. It doesn't mean I stay there, but so I may be strengthened, I may be equipped, I may do that. The same as with the fasting that we see in Scripture too. You see, these aren't things I check off a list and say, okay, now I'm spiritual, now I'm good, because I've done these things. That's not what Paul is trying to communicate here. Disciplines that are done to strengthen us to live a God-centered life. In the ordinary ways of our life. You see, these are the calisthenics that I'm doing that help me respond in the right way to that boss with whom I need great patience, to that need to forgive a spouse, to face trials with faith, to share my faith with someone else that's been confrontational. I've prepared myself. I've strengthened myself. I've trained myself in these things. That now I what? Trust my training. I've been strengthened as Timothy has. Where the warning was to look to God and His Word rather than the teachings that tickle our ears, the positive part of this message Is it to be strengthened in the spiritual disciplines? We need to listen to the word of God as well. So we have these four things to assist us in becoming a spiritual person. First, the two warnings, and then the two positives. The first warning was contrasted the God spirit, what God's spirit says, and what the deceiving spirit say. What's the bottom line? Listen to the spirit. The second was a warning against these extra-biblical teachings. Don't add to or subtract, subtract from what God says. The first positive was to nourish ourselves in the faith, to not yield to myths or what tickles our ears. And the second positive principle was to train ourselves and others in living a God-centered life. We live in a world that's not that much different than they lived in the days of Paul. There's pressures from all sides that we face. We need these warnings on the one hand, and we need this encouragement to raise ourselves up on the other. To remember that, as Paul has told Timothy here, the need to be nourished in the Word of God, to be nourished in the community of believers, to be strengthened in those things. If we are, then we will be able to stand, to resist the temptations in the world that surround us. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning as we consider your word, as we look to 
what Paul has said to Timothy here, that we will be encouraged, that we'll be strengthened in our faith, that we will lean into you all the more, Lord, as we find our hope and security in you alone.